Thank you, Judy. Welcome everyone near and far to our January lecture on the schizophrenia complex. We welcome back today our guest speaker from Orange, California, Eve Maram. Eve will follow up on her earlier lecture on this topic with more examples from her book, The Schizophrenia Complex. She will share with us her own and others' symptoms and reactions, including fear, denial, resistance, and inability to understand what's happening. Most of the experiences are beyond the control of the person and impact their lives very much. Furthermore, they have to cope with attitudes and reactions of others. She will expand her personal story to the collective and the archetypal level. Eve, Eve will show us how eros and hope can help one face the chaos of the unconscious. Dr. Eve Maram is a clinical and forensic psychologist and a certified Jungian analyst in private practice in Orange, California. She's a member of the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts and the C.G. Jung Institute of Santa Fe. Eve is also a member of the International Association for Analytical Psychology. So on her topic, the schizophrenia complex, feeling our way to a new attitude. Welcome Dr. Eve Mara. I guess I need to unmute. Uh, thank you very much, Virginia and Judy. And I am so honored that all of you are here. Uh, it's very moving. I, I'm going to be talking with you about uh, this book, which just came out a few months ago, The Schizophrenia Complex. Um, and the object of my talk is both to share the journey of that book with you, and also, uh, and the reason for the title, Feeling Our Way to a New Attitude, is because it's my hope that uh, by bringing uh, the perspective that I hope to share with this book, uh, we can do just that. Um, that's why it's so heartwarming to me to see all of you here. Um, I haven't presented on this in a group like this before. So thanks for making it sound like this is my second go round with this book. I did on Psychopathy Within, which is another one of those easy breezy topics, but um, this is it, uh, the intro for um, sharing this book, this writing with the world. I'm gonna share my screen now, and I hope you'll bear with me while I figure out what I'm doing here. Um, all right. So I don't, doesn't seem like it's happening. Um, you see the green. There it is. There we go. So is that you did it? You did it. Okay, I did it. So far, so good. Okay. Um, I also have a bit of a throat thing going on. So if I'm clearing my throat a lot, it's not entirely nerves and psychosomatic. It's because I have a thing that won't go away. <laughs> so um Not quite getting my own screen share the way I want it to be. Okay. Um, this book seems to generate the very complex that it describes. This book is not defining schizophrenia. If anything, it, uh, it is an observation of how much we don't know and that we really don't know what this is. Uh, we have a lot of theories, um, we have a lot of research, um, but mostly uh, what we are dealing with, uh, given this dynamic, is 
the mystery and the chaos of the unconscious. And that's the, the perspective that I uh, developed uh, in my own attitude towards schizophrenia. Um, there are personal uh, descriptions in this writing, which make it a hard uh, book to talk about, honestly. Um, and then, of course, I expand, as Virginia suggested, outward from my personal experience to uh, make more general observations and comments about um, the schizophrenia complex. What I mean by the schizophrenia complex is the thoughts and feelings that are generated by any encounter with schizophrenia. And that means an encounter with the chaos of the unconscious. It can be something we experience with a family member. It can be something we experience with someone on the street. It can be something we experience when we worry about ourselves and our own uh, stability. Um, the reason why I think this book is important, why it's important to me, why I wanted to write all this down is because I do hope for a shift in our collective attitude, which of course starts with each of us individually in terms of how we respond to all the many things that we call schizophrenia. I'll give a brief example. I have a friend who is not in this field and uh, but I've known for many, many years, a dear friend, I gave her the book. At first she said, oh, I, it's just much, you know, a lot of terminology and sounds kind of academic and this. I, I just can't really get into it. And then she kept reading a little bit and she said, you know, it really did change my perspective. And um, when I see someone like on the street who is uh, behaving oddly, who is exhibiting what we would know as psychosis, she says, I noticed a shift in the way I responded. And it wasn't something um, conscious that she intended, it's that she suddenly felt a little less um, repulsed. <laughs> and so that's an example of feeling our way to a new attitude. Um, so I'm going to be reading some excerpts from the book. Sometimes they are on the PowerPoint slides. I apologize to those of you who feel affronted by seeing up on the screen what is also being stated. I get it. But in this case, I felt that I hope that it will um, sort of amplify what I have to say. Um, and certainly there will be, as uh, Virginia mentioned, time for questions at the end. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start to help uh, explain why this book, not a book I would have chosen, by the way, um, but it found me. I had no choice. Um, I had a dream. Now, this dream was now probably about nine and a half years ago. It's in the book. Um, and I'm going to read the dream uh, because I think it gives uh, a bit of a, a metaphor, an image of um, this whole process that I've had with writing the book and why. In the dream, I was alone in an underground area of a large unfamiliar building, maybe a YMCA, needing to complete my workout by diving into a small round rimmed pool of cool dark water in the center of a small windowless dimly lit room. I was anxious and torn as I felt that in order to complete what I expected of myself, I needed to dive in and start swimming, but the prospect was terrifying. Even in the dream, although I couldn't bring myself to actually take the plunge, I could vividly imagine what it would be like swimming tight laps in this narrow, black, seemingly bottomless sinkhole, far from the light of day, alone and claustrophobic. At the time, upon reflection, I worried that this dream implied I was less open to my unconscious than I prided myself on being as a good Jungian. What I perceive now is that this was a necessarily unsettling prospective message from my own depths something far from my conscious attitude and certainly not arriving by choice. 
That was March, and on July 2nd, my adult son had an unexpected psychotic break, leaving the rest of us metaphorically doing laps in the darkness, trying to get back on solid ground. In the years since, my journey has involved developing a relationship with schizophrenia and our complexes around it. First, through my son, who has blessedly returned from the unreachable depths, and then more recently, as we have all had some time to breathe, through the rest of our family, all of whom love him and are so deeply affected by his trajectory. It is the feeling dimension of this experience which constitutes my focus here. My son did not undergo his deep dive alone. The feelings associated with his journey continue to impact our lives, along with the unsolicited onus of trying to shift forever an unbidden hereditary burden the previously unspoken complex in our family generated by the experience of having a family member with schizophrenia. On some level, which I discuss in the book, that complex affects families for generations, both literally and psychically. And what I'm referring to there is that in the process of doing all that, that we had to in response to my son's experience and finding our, our ourselves in this process, um, it also came to light in ways that I had been unaware of before uh, that my mother apparently had a sister who had schizophrenia and their family dealt with that information in an opposite way. Uh, it was um, a family secret obviously not secret anymore. Um, so I wasn't told uh, when I was growing up. And um, so that has been part of my experience of this writing too, because I um, here I am sharing with all of you something that my mother took pains to hide for her entire life. So um, that's been difficult. Um, my Jungian studies, of course, were fundamental in terms of my understanding of schizophrenia and certainly Jung, uh, his experiences at the Burke Holtzley, his work with schizophrenia had everything to do with so many of his, his most fundamental contributions, uh, the archetypes, the collective unconscious. I'll speak more to that a little later. This is such a huge topic. And as I mentioned, not one that I uh, chose. Um, and I realize I'm experiencing it even as I'm talking with you, the, the difficulty that there is around uh, discussing this subject. Um, this, of course, is a very classic um, quote from Jung. Um, You will... I'm having some difficulty with the screen. Sorry. Be silent and listen. This is from the Red Book, of course. Have you recognized your madness and do you admit it? Have you noticed that all your foundations are completely mired in madness? Do you not want to recognize your madness and welcome it in a friendly manner? You wanted to accept everything, so accept madness too. Let the light of your madness shine and it will suddenly dawn on you. Madness is not to be despised and not to be feared, but instead you should give it light. If you want to find paths, you should also not spurn madness since it makes up such great part of your nature. Be glad that you can recognize it, for you will thus avoid becoming its victim. Madness is a special form of the spirit and clings to all teachings and philosophies, but even more to daily life since life itself is full of craziness and at bottom utterly illogical. Man strives toward reason only so that he can make rules for himself. Life itself has no rules. That is its mystery and its unknown law. What you call knowledge is an attempt to impose something comprehensible on life. 
And there's the dynamic. I hope I am taking us back to again and again through this writing and hopefully in my conversation with you today. Uh, these these intrinsic uh, dimensions to our lives in terms of the juxtaposition of chaos and order, how we we yearn for order and yet you know the chaos is such a um, an inseparable aspect of our experience and when it's out of balance certainly it affects us tremendously and that has everything to do with what we call schizophrenia and how it sh it rattles us okay and here's one of those times when i'm going to read something that is directly from the book um, a complex uh, in general is an emotionally charged knot of largely unconscious feelings and beliefs that has a powerful influence on perceptions and behaviors. It's a pod of feeling toned ideas or images that accumulate around certain archetypes, meaning unconscious, universally inherited human patterns of thought or behavioral, literal, symbolic, and psychic. At its core, the complex occurs in response to an experience that is in some way archetypal. When complexes are constellated, they're invariably accompanied by affect and remain relatively autonomous, relatively. Jung says that a complex, quote unquote, is the image of a certain psychic situation, which is strongly accentuated emotionally and is incompatible with the habitual attitude of consciousness. The schizophrenia complex, as I conceptualize it, is not the phenomenon of schizophrenia itself viewed as a complex, but concerns the emotionally charged thoughts and feelings generated in response to the schizophrenic condition. The archetypal core of such a feeling-toned complex might be the image of chaos. Now, this way of defining a schizophrenia complex is different from Jung. Certainly there is overlap, but it's a little different. And I'll talk more about that. Now, back in, I believe, yeah, it was 2016, I had begun writing about schizophrenia and hoped to get away with writing one article in Psych Perspectives um, and that was only the beginning. Um, but this is an excerpt from that article that I wanted to share with you. I've come to perceive schizophrenia as less about a split mind, as the etymology suggests, than an unruly expanded one. The visions and dreams, the lack of differentiation between the dream world and the waking one that characterize schizophrenia reflect the diffuse vastness of the unconscious, unfettered by the constraints and the organizing functions of consciousness. The unconscious as a construct both repels and lures us. Schizophrenia generally just repels us. It represents unconsciousness, unbounded, lost in space, a separation of the mind while the body is eerily still before us staring at or through us from that other intangible dimension on the street corner, strolling lopsidedly down Venice Beach, sleeping on cardboard, in the hospital waiting room, the therapy office, or our living room. Who would face or even visit such a monster voluntarily? After all, that monster represents the aspects of ourselves we would most like to avoid. Our own capacity for madness, the mad state of our limited existence, the universal human reality of our eventual absorption into death, the great unsolvable mystery of our very being. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how schizophrenia is defined uh, from a clinical perspective, uh, and we'll visit that because, of course, uh, it's relevant. Uh, but I'm doing it as background, as context, and not the emphasis of uh, what I hope to uh, share most with you here today. 
Um, schizophrenia is described in current clinical psychiatry as a, a constellation, signs and sim symptoms that include, not necessarily all of these, but hallucinations, delusions, disorganized thinking, and grossly disorganized or abnormal motor behavior, including catatonia. Those are referred to as positive symptoms because they're feelings and behaviors that are overt, observable, and atypical of the individual's normal functioning. The condition also includes negative symptoms that represent a reduction or loss of normal functioning, quote unquote, in some way, a blunting of affect, a poverty of speech and thought, apathy, anhedonia, joylessness, a lack of social drive or interest, avolition, lost motivation, and inattention to input from the external world. So back a couple of DSMs ago, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, there were several subtypes of schizophrenia listed. They're no longer in our current edition, the DSM-5-TR. Uh, but I find this helpful in terms of how we think about it. Um, So those subtypes are paranoid. We all, I think everyone here would know what that is. Catatonic, which is where a person is like frozen. Undifferentiated or hebephrenic, which is a, the childlike type. Um, and of course, people don't necessarily fit neatly into these categories. Some types of symptoms show more than others, but a commonality is the inner chaos experienced by someone with an ego submerged in the unconscious. And that's another image I hope you will leave here today uh, having uh, registered in some regard. One way that this chaos manifests is in the form of unregulated affect or behavior that may be extroverted, introverted, or both. And this is particularly relevant to the schizophrenia complex since it's usually the odd behavior reflective of inner chaos that triggers a strong emotional response in those who encounter it. Another way to describe that would be the positive symptoms are usually what catches our attention, even though the, the, the negative symptoms may be just as disturbing and um, difficult. Our relationship with our inner madness with the unconscious has everything to do with what schizophrenia means in our culture and in our psyches, both personal and collective. Individually and collectively, our avoidance of this aspect of human existence is significant. Fear, avoidance, and blind hatred, othering, create a marginalization that damages at least as deeply as a scattered mind if not more so. The schizophrenia complex is both intimately subjective and archetypal, affecting everyone differently. The experience of everything we mean by schizophrenia and our encounters with it can be conceptualized, and here's that, the idea again, as the ego submergence in the unconscious. The schizophrenia complex can be understood in terms of a profound ripple effect from personal to collective, numinous, and symbolic. And I've included the, this uh, illustration on the, the upper right-hand corner, and this is from Edinger, uh, Ego and Archetype. It's on page five. But this, uh, he wrote about it in some different ways, but this speaks to me in particular uh, with relevance to what I image happening with schizophrenia, uh, which is that the ego becomes submerged in the self. So the navigation function is shut down. <clears throat> Differences between Jung's definition of a schizophrenia complex and mine. Daryl Sharp, Jungian analyst, um, 
made the following statement. Jung believed that many psychoses, and particularly schizophrenia, were psychogenic, resulting from an abaissement de nouveau mental, French, lowering of consciousness, and an ego too weak to resist the onslaught of unconscious contents. There's that flooding again. The complex of an individual with schizophrenia, as Jung described it, is radically dissociated from any unifying personality, a split that reaches the organic structure of the individual. This condition differs from Jung's definition of a complex in general as feeling toned. Jung seemed to refer to a schizophrenia complex as the state of schizophrenia itself within an individual bearing its symptoms, rather than an emotional reaction to the condition itself involving unresolved feelings and beliefs. Right. Segue to um, Jung's definition of a complex in general as feeling toned, he described as follows. It is the image of a certain situation which is strongly accentuated emotionally and is moreover incompatible with the habitual attitude of consciousness. This image has a powerful inner coherence. It has its own wholeness and in addition, a relatively high degree of autonomy so that it is subject to the control of the conscious mind to only a limited extent, and therefore behaves like an animated foreign body in the sphere of consciousness. And to go a little bit further into this um, description of Jung's ideas about um, schizophrenia complex as differentiated from the way I'm defining it. The late Jungian analyst Errol Shelley discussed the complex as having a task to serve as a vessel uh, and, a, and a vessel of transformation, whereby the archetypal essence is brought into living reality. In someone with a strong enough ego, this process can occur fairly readily. The complexes enable a relatively smooth transition from the archetypal to the personal. However, for someone in a psychotic state, archetypal contents flood the ego to such an extent that the vessel of transformation cannot hold. In other words, the complex can't do its job. Excuse me, it should have been vehicle and vessel of transformation in the beginning of that quote. As an illustration, Shalit refers to Jung's distinction between soul complexes and spirit complexes, the former being more like a regular feeling tone complex and the latter being more like Jung's description of a schizophrenia complex, i.e. radically disconnected from ego consciousness. Jung compared the experiences of these two different kinds of complexes with the primitive belief in souls and spirits. Souls correspond to the autonomous complexes of the personal unconscious and spirits to those of the collective unconscious. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read a, a bit from the book that I think amplifies this. Um, we may deduce that soul complexes are essentially useful to the individual's developing sense of identity since they can be assimilated into consciousness, whereas spirit complexes are associated with psychosis with an ego too weak to withstand the archetypal world. And so the complex cannot perform its transformative task. This differentiation helps to explain Jung's ideas about the differences between feeling toned complexes, which would be like soul complexes, and what he calls a schizophrenia complex, which would be a spirit complex. Jung did not discuss complexes that arise in response to encountering schizophrenia in another person or complexes in people with schizophrenia that are feeling toned 
and not fully split off. That does happen. I'll be talking more about that. Okay. And this slide basically reiterates what I just said. only with a picture. I don't make the distinction that Jung did between the schizophrenia complex characteristic of somebody with schizophrenia and the normal or neurotic complexes of others impacted by the condition, which I also refer to as a schizophrenia complex. The barely accessible unresolved feelings and beliefs that we hold about any encounter with madness, even a personal one, are often at least as devastating a challenge as the experience itself. This is to ourselves and also to others that are impacted by our attitude. That's from page 26 in the book. Schizophrenia itself isn't a complex as I'm defining it, which is different from Jung. What we call schizophrenia involves incursions from the unconscious, affective and energetic experience disconnected from consciousness. In contrast, the schizophrenia complex, as I'm describing it, has to do with the thoughts and emotions that er arise from a conscious experience of encountering schizophrenia. Thus, the complex can occur in an individual who has suffered psychosis themselves and recovered enough ego consciousness to recall reflect upon and retrieve ego-associated affect with some insight. The complex is also triggered in others whose lives are impacted by those who suffer schizophrenia. In a nutshell, what we're talking about is the stigma associated with that state. the chaos of submergence in the unconscious. Barry Williams is a wonderful uh, training analyst and a shaman uh, who um, I heard speak in Santa Fe probably right around the time I was beginning a lot of this writing. And he talked about the potential for something transformative in the undoing of one's life. Of course, that isn't something most of us would choose, but many of us have experienced such turns of events. And that it's key that this is about the undoing of one's life, at least as one has perceived it to be, because part of what happens, I think, with an encounter uh, with chaos in some form is that in order to reconstitute, one is forever transformed. And if we're able to use the experience, it can lead to a development instead of pure destruction. <laughs> so he said this. The cure for psychopathology is to unpathologize it. The just so-ness of life is the beauty of it, even if the ego is experiencing it as beautiful or unbearable. There's no increase in consciousness without sacrifice. Sacrifice is part of individuation and sacrifice is archetypal. You have to go through the undoing of your life in order to have your life. And that's from the book on page 30, but originally from Barry. Okay, this is an interesting concept, which many of you are familiar with, I'm guessing, either clinically or in your personal experience uh, with others, if not yourself. Um, my son told me that when he was on Venice Beach in a psychotic state, he recalled a sense of joy, freedom, independence like I hadn't felt before, open, strong, outgoing, adventurous with my mind. All quotes, by the way, are with his permission. Um, he also described being nuts, believing wholeheartedly in things that aren't real. I miss it in a way, and I don't. When I was not on meds, I had more energy, but I couldn't live in society. The dream world is fun, but I enjoy having stability. Needless to say, this was after he had stabilized uh, following his return. 
In hindsight, about that period many years later, he reflected, quote unquote, I was in pain the whole time I was in psychosis. He had restored that lost affect to his ego consciousness. He was able to identify the emotional valence of everything that he'd been through, not just personally, but the way people responded to him, the effect that some of his experiences had on others. What that means, of course, is that he was capable at that point of his own schizophrenia complex, as I am defining it. I'm using the term schizophrenia complex in a way that's akin to our typical understanding of a complex's feeling tones, accessible to some ego consciousness, although relatively compartmentalized, relatively. Defined thus, the schizophrenia complex in a schizophrenic individual involves that individual's conscious feelings and emotions about his or her psychotic condition. For example, when somebody with schizophrenia starts to become aware of being looked at quizzically by others and to feel and express the emotional impact of such observation, there is an opening of sorts. The affect consciously experienced by the individual is then accessible as a feeling tone complex. The associated affect is no longer split off, fully autonomous and compartmentalized from consciousness. As such, this is an important point, I think, to be able to be in a complex is actually a sign of recovery for somebody with schizophrenia. To have a complex requires an ego that's not fully submerged in the unconscious. It requires a degree of consciousness, the ability to reflect and to name affects. I'm not gonna go a great deal into uh, details of my family legacy, but I think these two quotes from Jung uh, might be helpful in terms of understanding the relevance of um, family history to how we develop our felt responses to everything that we call schizophrenia. It's not usually something people talk about and certainly in generations past, even less so. Um, from Jung, psychologically, the central point of a human personality is the place where the ancestors are reincarnated. And nothing influences children more than the silent facts in the background. Okay. So I'm gonna read just a snippet from the book on page 37. Um, the secret encapsulated trauma surrounding schizophrenia in my mother's family was an unspoken part of my psychic legacy that surfaced when I was forced to deal with the emergence of schizophrenia in my own. In the writing, I chose to illuminate that history toward healing our family schizophrenia complex because secrecy did not work. That hasn't been an easy choice. Um, and I'm hoping that by the sacrifice of putting this history forward, um, it will serve a, a, a greater good. Um, and if you read the book or if you have, then there's more detail in there, but for the purpose of today, that's where I'm gonna leave it. An encounter with schizophrenia carries an invitation to get in touch with our own madness. We would rather refuse if given a choice. An archetypal challenge faces us. We, we are dealing with inner and outer conflicts representing chaos and order, the lure of madness and the need for balance. Uh, Nathan Filer is a mental health nurse who wrote a book called Heartland, which is a, a charming book, uh, a very uh, compassionate uh, view toward uh, mental illness and specifically psychosis. Uh, he alludes to the incredible impact of schizophrenia, even the word, uh, which does uh, trigger 
uh, all kinds of emotional responses upon the immediate sufferer, but also the rest of us. He's hopeful that it's possible for a shift of consciousness around schizophrenia while honoring the archetypal scope of this problem, emphasizing its emotional impact. And this quote is from his book. I won't ask that you do this because even if you said it aloud, I won't hear you. Um, what a word, huh? I wonder if you might consider trying something for me. Say the word schizophrenia out loud a few times, not beneath your breath. Really say it. Say it loud enough that you feel self-conscious, that you worry someone will hear. Say it loud enough that someone might hear. Feel the shape of it. Stay with it. Think about what that, that word evokes in you. What thoughts does it arrive with? What feelings? Please remember this as you do so. Whole lives have disappeared beneath that word. I'm going to um, lapse to a, a little reading here, uh, which has to do with this invitation to get in touch with our own madness when we encounter schizophrenia, because I think uh, that was a, a big part of the message of that dream I shared with you at the beginning of our talk today. Um, any encounter with schizophrenia carries an invitation to get in touch with our own madness. We would rather refuse if given a choice. My sinkhole dream described in the preface presents just, just such a justifiable terror. The challenge of diving into that black bottomless pool is not like walking a child to swim class and encouraging them to be unafraid, coaxing a step toward a positive development. Contrarily, it could re represent a psychic dissolution that is not in service to individuation at all, but a leap into nothing for nothing, at least not for a part of our existence we can know or own. Who in their right mind would choose that? In such an instance, wariness is healthy, maybe a healthy defense against being overwhelmed, against the threat of disintegration. The desire to avoid such an experience is reasonable, even self-preserving. It is to be afraid of the loss of our very sense of self. That dive into the bottomless dark waters represents the annihilation of consciousness, of the ego, and the strength we work hard for, need, and count on. We want to stay in that brightly lit room for understandable and legitimate reasons. So in that dream, why was I tempted and even cajoled by myself, the dream ego, my inner gym teacher, to dive into the pool and do my exercises? While every fiber of my being pulled away from the dreaded task, perhaps because something in me, in us, does compel us to know more to bring to consciousness what we can from the seeming black void of the unknown. That inner dialogue does seem in the service of individuation and may in fact be prerequisite. Here we have yet another tension of opposites, that safe brightly lit room of ego consciousness juxtaposed with the boundless reaches of the dark unconscious. The nature of our human existence inevitably bridges both and failure to balance the tension between these realities can be mortally destructive. The challenge of navigating these opposites is enough to strike justifiable terror into anyone's heart. And of course, that kind of a struggle is archetypal. Although described as a thought disorder, the lived experience of schizophrenia is mired in the realm of affect, both for those afflicted whose own conscious feeling associations are lost and for those others affected by their loved ones' heartbreaking unavailability. Schizophrenia attacks relatedness through a confluence of factors, including emotional disconnection and the feelings of otherness, shame, and stigma that surround this experience for everyone that it touches. And I'm going to read you um, a small quote from, from my son, a couple of them. And this was from a fairly recent reflection. <clears throat> when I was psychotic, I was angry at anyone who came in my way. So my feelings toward you were ultimately defiant. 
I look back in retrospect and realize that it was about having freedom to do what I wanted to do, and I didn't have a liking for rules and discipline. Once I regained some reality to my life, I was calmer and more patient, which, you, which in turn gave me the ability to love and care for you and the ones I love. As time went on and I continued to take medication, I began to feel the connection we once had. I would say that respect is one aspect that is most prevalent with me toward you and the whole family. When I was psychotic, I really didn't think about anybody but myself. That has completely changed as well. I look forward to helping others and you and also myself. There is positive communication that is caring and understanding along with being able to sympathize. And another quote, very brief. First and most importantly, I have the love and support of my family. I don't know what I would be doing without the love and support of you guys. I put myself in many situations that made me stuck on an island and you gave me a lifeboat to live in. What reels us back to land from the far reaches of the unconscious? There is no one answer. Perhaps we have to come apart in order to reconstitute the lives we were meant to have, sacrificing the script written by ego as I was challenged to do, or salvaging an ego flooded by the unconscious as my son was challenged to do. Sometimes it is love that reels us back. Inevitably, sometimes it is the opposite. In two essays on analytical psychology, Jung included the following from Freud's posthumous writings about two basic instincts, eros and death. The aim of eros is to establish ever greater unities and to preserve them thus, in short, to bind together. The aim of the destructive instinct is, on the contrary, to undo connections and so to destroy things. For this reason, we also call it the death instinct. And Jung comments, life, like any other process, has a beginning and an end, and every beginning is also the beginning of the end. What Freud probably means is the essential fact that every process is a phenomenon of energy, and that all energy can proceed only from the tension of opposites. How does this tie in? The complicated interplay of energies that resulted in the return of my son to solid ground undoubtedly included both destruction and love. Both were necessary. There was a destruction of the old order of our lives, inner and outer, and the power of love that allowed us to remain connected through that arduous journey. Okay, here we are. Extremely significant um, part of um, Jung's uh, contributions. Um, in the psychiatric hospital in Zurich, uh, the Burkholtzli, uh, Jung was uh, living on the second floor as he was doing his psychiatric residency under the mentorship of Eugene Bloiler. That immersive work taught him about the mythopoetic nature of the unconscious. One defining difference between Freud and Jung was, of course, Jung's work with psychotic patients, which opened him to the mystery, chaos, and formlessness of the unconscious. Jung's courage to delve into this formidable milieu, inner and outer, with curiosity and openness, was a tremendous gift to all of us. Eugene Bloiler uh, and Emil Kraepelin, um, together, uh, had the seminal theories about schizophrenia and its its treatment uh, at that that time in history. Um, Bloiler's approach was a significant departure from Kraepelin's because it opened the possibility that psychotic patients hallucinations and delusions had a meaning and weren't simply byproducts of neurological degeneration. And Jung took this further, bridging the hallucinations of some patients to archetypal themes, which led to his uh, formulation of the concept of the collective unconscious. Um, we'll be talking more about um, one of his patients, Solar Phallus Man, who is uh, 
the best example that we uh, have uh, in terms of the discoveries he made linked to schizophrenia. Now, um, word association experiments uh, were extremely important uh, at that time in terms of his discovering um, all of these concepts, um, both complexes and uh, eventually the collective unconscious. Um, if you've seen the film, The Dangerous Method, this is just a little snippet of it, but it shows it's, it's basically measuring, of course, a patient's phy physiological responses uh, to a list of words, uh, measuring their reaction times and then analyzing those results. Um, we have a lot of measures of that kind used for different reasons, actually in forensic uh, psychology today, but this was the same idea where you're using a physiological measure to determine someone's unconscious uh, interest in something um, or a dynamic they uh, haven't revealed. Uh, this realization not only proved that unconscious factors are at work within us, it led, us, it, it led him to discover the universal human substrate of the collective unconscious, the deeper waters inherent to humankind. So we'll see if this, I don't know if this is gonna work. I'm gonna push it. I don't know if this is gonna, I don't think I can make it happen. I'm sorry. Well, uh, you'll have to use your imagination if you haven't seen the, the movie. Um, he will read a word and he's watching this dial in terms of uh, the time it takes the patient to respond. And if there's a pause, that significant suggests that there's a, a trigger there that can be uh, parsed out. Uh, did you, Eve, did you try yeah. clicking on the image itself, not the link? Oh, no, there's nothing there. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. But we're not getting sound. Did you click that setting I told you about to for the sound? Probably not. Let's see. Um, sure. Yeah, that's Thanks. money. Thanks. How? Child. Soon. Family. Are we? I'm not hearing you now. It, yeah, it worked. We heard it. Heard it. Okay. Okay. The Zoom complex. <laughs> so here we go. We're just going to move on. That's a, um, a piece of the puzzle anyway. Okay, most of you have heard of, of solar phallus man. Um, and this is the, the experience that really uh, tripped the switch in terms of his understanding uh, that the hallucinations of these psychotic patients had archetypal themes, which uh, did a lot to normalize, uh, shift uh, our perceptions about psychosis, all right? Um, Prototypical example of um, Jung's thinking in this regard rose through his work with a schizophrenic patient. This is from 59 in the book, known as a solar phallus man. In 1906, one of his patients at the hospital had been diagnosed as an incurable paranoid schizophrenic. This man was uneducated and at times very disturbed, but during quiet periods, he was able to communicate his visions and ideas to the doctors. One day, Jung discovered him standing by the window, moving his head from side to side and blinking into the sun. The patient brought Jung to the window and entreated him to do the same, as then he would see something interesting. Jung asked what this man was seeing and the man responded, surely doctor, you will see the tail of the sun, the sun's penis. When I move my head to and fro, it moves too, and that is where the wind comes from. Jung, uh, um, at the time, Jung knew nothing of mythology or archaeology, and the encounter puzzled him, but he made note of it. About four years later, in 1910, when Jung was engrossed in his mytholog mythological studies, he discovered the well-known philologist Albert Dietrich's 
uh, a Mithras lit liturgy in which he recognized the delusional material of his former patient. This book from a famous Paris library published a Greek papyrus dealing with a Mithraic ritual for the first time. The relevant passage as Jung excerpted reads as follows. Draw breath from the rays, draw in three times as strongly as you can, and you will seem to be in the middle of the aerial region. The path of the visible gods will appear through the disk of the sun, who is God my father. Likewise, there will be seen the so-called tube, the origin of the ministering wind, for you will see hanging down from the disk of the sun something that looks like a tube, and toward the region westward, it is as though there were an infinite east wind. But if the other wind should prevail toward the regions in the, of the east, in like fashion, you'll see the vision veering in that direction. The striking similarity between the hallucination of his patient and the Mithraic liturgy prompted Jung to investigate further, leading to his discovery of many parallels between motifs in the mythologies of various ethnic groups and the visions and dreams of people who had never heard of them. This led him to conclude that there are myth forming structural elements in the unconscious. This realization was instrumental to his understanding of the collective unconscious and the archetypes. It also suggests that this kind of autonomous expression of the psyche is involved in producing the hallucinations and delusions of schizophrenia. Jung's discovery that this man's psychotic fantasy was in fact a, my a myth was monumental. This raised it to a meaningful story instead of just a madman's delusion to be dismissed, ignored, feared, or medicated away. This discovery and Jung's attitude about it in a sense humanized psychosis. At least ideologically, such a discovery had the potential to impact prevailing emotional responses to schizophrenia, the terrain of the schizophrenia complex. Jung's observations suggested that while we may perceive people with schizophrenia as different in kind, they are but different in degree. He later profoundly expressed his unique capacity to relate to his own irrational interiority in the Red Book. Universally, we human beings are myth-making creatures. Also bridging from the word associations, studies early 1900s, Jung determined that effective treatment for schizophrenia needed to incorporate, even emphasize, a restoration and strengthening of the ego to bracket and organize the unconscious contents that are constellated in schizophrenia. He wrote, the complex has an abnormal autonomy in hysteria and tendency to an active separate existence, which reduces and replaces the constellating power of the ego complex. And I know he uses the term hysteria there, but that was a popular term in those days. And it's relevant to our understanding of what we call schizophrenia. And there we have that illustration again, which I think is helpful in terms of uh, the concept, ego flooded. So theories about schizophrenia, and here there is of course a, a nod to that, a chapter in the book, I can't begin to do it justice. There are volumes of theories about schizophrenia um, for our purposes, as I mentioned earlier, purposes to lay a bit of a context that this is not our ancestors. Uh, now, Kraepelin uh, defined or called schizophrenia, what we call schizophrenia, dementia praecox, which literally means early dementia. So he thought of it as a, a form of early dementia. Different. Bloiler, uh, Bluler, excuse me, Schizophrenia, split mind, split, splitting of the psychic as opposed to the neurological functioning. And then ego psychology, which is the school of psychoanalysis rooted in Freud's structural id, ego, superego model of the mind. Um, this is where the whole idea of the refrigerator mother that you may have heard of comes from. Uh, the implications of their ideas about schizophrenia uh, and its cause were devastating for schizophrenic children and families. I think this is the era probably, it's a little after it, but my mother's uh, growing up experience, they, you know, have, there was a, such a shame associated with having a family member that had schizophrenia. Terrible, terrible shame and guilt, um, which of course added to the, the problems of the, the situation as it was. 
uh, because it attributed psychosis to parental failure, that the genesis of psych schizophrenia is an emotional and psychological defense response. The mother's uh, cold and unavailable, then um, it will result in schizophrenia. That definitely wasn't my problem. If anything, I was the other direction. I think that the a take home from that uh, school of thought, however, is, is that there is definitely a component in terms of the parental relationship to um, how a particular personality may develop what we call schizophrenia, but it's it's not as, as linear or um, specific as uh, the refrigerator mother theory. Um, there were two uh, very uh, creative um, psychiatrists who had a different attitude towards schizophrenia. R.D. Lang, uh, he was a psychiatrist, Scottish, um, and then J.W. Perry, they both written extensively, uh, a Jungian analyst and psychiatrist, stark contrast to the normative medical model of the definition meaning and best treatment for schizophrenia. Um, they felt that it had a, a meaning uh, that could be, that if, if, if only it was responded to uh, with uh, acceptance and that it could be treated as a creative process toward uh, a person's development, uh, that it uh, didn't need to be medicated and that kind of thing. So it was, it was a helpful uh, dimension. It was a helpful attitude, but it was extreme and not uh, readily practiced in the, the real world. Created some balance in the thinking, I guess. So, uh, a common denominator in all theorizing about schizophrenia is our deep human need to solve essentially insoluble mysteries, or at least agree about a meaning. When such efforts fail, unwanted emotions can be triggered, and a complex likely ensues. Part of the revulsion and avoidance that surrounds schizophrenia is the archetypal frustration constellated by our inability fully to understand or to solve it. An encounter with schizophrenia reminds us of our ultimate humility before the unconscious, that great sea that rumbles always beneath our neat lies, sometimes not so neat. Um, in many references, the whole opus, the work of individuation, and we're gonna lapse into a, a little bit of a reference to to an alchemical um, perspective on schizophrenia and the complex, although I'm just going to visit briefly and there's more in the book on this. In many references, um, in this individuation process is summarized by the, the phrase dissolve and coagulate. Just as calcinatio pertains to the element of fire, coagulatio to the element earth, and sublimatio to the element air, solutio pertains to water. All that is stuck is put in, in solution to allow movement. It is used to symbolize softening or melting processes. It is representative of dissolution, dispersal, and even dismemberment. For the alchemist, solutio was the process by which the differentiated matter returned to its original undifferentiated state, the prima materia. Alchemical recipes for the solutio operation give us an image of a descent into the unconscious. It is the prima materia prior to the differentiation of the elements by consciousness. What we call schizophrenia could be described as the immersion, here we go again, of the ego in the unconscious, a form of dissolution. This corresponds to the alchemical stage of solutio. Now, Edinger, the one, the diagram that I shared a couple of times, suggested that this state of, and I'm reading for the book now on page 79, um, suggested that this state of immersion in the undifferentiated waters of the unconscious is necessary for positive transformation and actually corresponds to the process of successful therapy or analysis, which examines the products of the unconscious and puts the established ego attitudes into question. There are various ways in which this immersion in the unconscious can occur, the outcome of which depends largely upon the relative stability of the ego. One may undergo a figurative trial by dismemberment via descent into the unconscious from which, from which a fairly well-developed ego would subsequently emerge, or one may undergo a blissful but dangerous process that fits Neumann's concept of Ouroboric incest in which an immature ego might be engulfed. 
In order for things to work out in the aftermath of any form of psychic dissolution, the next stage of coagulatio must follow, pulling it together, whereby Edinger said archetypal contents are egoized. In other words, according to Jung, the ego recovers sufficient consolidation to be central to the person's experience, which is then organized around it. In therapy or analysis, this next stage is promoted by a good enough therapist or analyst. Edinger further stated, the extreme case of failure of the archetypal images to become concretized, in other words, when one is stuck in solutio, is found in overt schizophrenia. The ego is literally inundated by boundless primordial archetypal images. Such an individual has had inadequate opportunity to experience the archetypes mediated and personalized through human relationships. I disagree. I have a problem with that last statement because, um, first of all, I think in our developmental uh, the curve of our lives, uh, we tend to experience that transition from solutio to coagulatio, not just once but many times. And um, at least in terms of my son's experience, as I understood it, uh, he had uh, many opportunities for human relationships and uh, was good at them and actually was able to navigate um, that transition from the solutio phases we associate with young adulthood, childhood, adolescence into uh, the next consolidated state quite well until he wasn't. Um, more about that in the book if you're interested. Um, there are many, many ways to, to uh, there are many metaphors for this same idea of the dynamic interchange between chaos and order. Um, not just in terms of understanding what schizophrenia is, but the emotions that we uh, experience uh, that are constellated by an encounter with it. If chaos represents the state of schizophrenia, then order corresponds to the ego consolidation necessary to restabilize. Our emotional responses to order are usually egocentric, not so to chaos. Chaos is usually experienced as threatening. When the level of threat is felt to be intolerable, it's likely to go into a complex. And the story of Icarus is um, a good example, I think, of uh, that juxtaposition between chaos and order and what can happen when the balance is off. The classic story of Icarus, and I'm just gonna read a little of this. His father is the master craftsman Daedalus, creator of the labyrinth. Icarus and his father attempt to escape from Crete using wings Daedalus has constructed from feathers and wax. Daedalus warns Icarus not to fly either too low or too high, lest the sea's dampness clog the wings or the sun's heat melt them. But Icarus does fly too close to the sun, as we all know. His wings melt and he tumbles from the sky into the ocean where he drowns. This image is an archetypal backdrop, an archetypal backdrop for the story of schizophrenia. The myth of Icarus can be construed as a warning against complacency or insufficient libido, which would be flying too low, or hubris flying too high. But it also suggests what can happen when our affect goes unregulated. Metaphorically, the wax holding our wings together melts and we can no longer keep on course and steer. We lose navigation of our lives. As an archetypal image, the sun can represent enlightenment, creativity, energy, and spiritual wisdom, by getting too close to it, becoming inflated and losing a balanced perspective can burn and destroy. The capacity to regulate affect is compromised in schizophrenia. Affect becomes disconnected from ego consciousness. Icarus learning to fly in the middle, not too low or too high, could be understood as a metaphor for finding the necessary balance between consciousness and unconsciousness. Is tipping too high between destroys his ability to navigate at all. This is a metaphor for the seductive exhilaration associated with madness. 
Icarus meets his ultimate destruction by drowning in the ocean. In other words, he plummets into the sea of the unconscious. And we can imagine poor grieving Daedalus would have been left with a schizophrenia complex, his affect laden with guilt, shame, frustration, and deep sorrow. Okay, a nod to medication. No discussion of schizophrenia is complete without that. Um, I mentioned very briefly Perry and Lang, um, who were basically radically uh, non-invasive anti-medication. And then um, goodness knows there have been uh, a wide range of truly uh, frightening psychiatric approaches from electroshock therapy um, to antipsychotics and now newer versions of antipsychotics, which are slightly less frightening. Um, as I wrote in the Schizophrenia Complex book, I found nowhere in the real world where it was possible to experiment safely with allowing the illness to run its course sans medication in the interest of promoting its meaning as a creative adaptation and inviting higher consciousness. Would that that were true. Um, Antipsychotic treatments are a heart-rending catch-22 because there is a price to be paid. Uh, there's a certain dulling of affect along with other uh, difficult side effects, even though the state of affairs now is much better than it ever has been before. Anisognosia is a term I talk more about in the, the, the book, and it has to do with the belief that most people who have this illness uh, don't believe that anything is wrong with them. which is why it's very difficult to get them to take medication in the first place. Anisognosia or lack of insight is a symptom of severe mental illness that impairs a person's ability to understand and perceive his or her illness. It's the single largest reason why people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder refuse medications or do not seek treatment. Getting someone to take medication initially is all but impossible since a characteristic symptom of psychosis is the gut level firm conviction that they absolutely don't need help or intervention. That's anosognosia. Okay. And of course, medications are affect hammers. Even the best antipsychotic drug treatments act as uh, they dull the, the emotions if they work to reduce or eliminate psychotic symptoms at all, leaving the patient in a heart-rending catch-22. And this is the reference to anhedonia, which is uh, joylessness. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from my son. I can feel this, this is from page 98 in the book. I can feel the subject of love, but not the meaning. I do feel love, but I don't feel it to the full extent because of medication. Medication is a very strong component. Anhedonia, loss of pleasure, is the worst part of side effect. Feeling nothing and not wanting to do anything. No excitement, no positives. Looking back, I remember enjoying food, coffee, drinking, eating, sensory pleasures. I can't feel it in my body. I had free feelings then, years ago prior to medication. I miss it in a way, and I don't. Not on meds, I had more energy, but I can't live in society. The dream world is fun but I have to take medication. I enjoy having stability. The medication literally saves me. When I started taking medication, it kind of put up a barrier between me and the world. It became difficult to engage with people. Even to this day, I still struggle with gatherings. When I was off medication, I was a chatterbox to everyone I didn't know, but I was talking as if I was a chicken with my head cut off. I aim to please. When I'm in a situation where it's uncouth to be who I really am, I will behave because I care about people and how they'll feel. So, uh, and I, I wrote this bullet point, uh, the role of stress and affect to uh, be sure to mention that um, someone who is on medication, including people that are interested in their remaining on medication or even getting on medication, uh, it creates a certain hypervigilance. Um, uh, there's an awareness of a psychic and affective fragility. 
both for the person who is on medication and for those who care about them. Uh, and that can that kind of a of a hypersensitivity, a hypervigilance can can be its own form of uh, schizophrenia complex. Uh, schizophrenia complex and therapy. Um, I talk more about this in the book. Uh, it's difficult to work with uh, people who are experiencing psychosis, and it may be impossible for some of us um, in uh, therapy or analysis. It depends upon uh, the degree of ego stability, how available that person can be with you in the room. But as a therapist or an analyst, uh, in order to work with someone in that kind of, of experience, it means entering uh, our own form of that, which is very challenging. And we have to keep a, you know, a foot on ground and a toe in the pool, so to speak. Um, the tendency in analysis to sidestep the act of experiencing and embracing psychotic aspects of a patient, patient's personality is all too common. An analyst's desire to employ understanding and thus avoid the experience of emptiness and dissociative chaos is difficult to put aside, but Jung's psychology encourages us to do just that. And that's from Nathan Schwartz a lot in um, Mad Parts of Sane People in Analysis, edited by Murray Stein. Um, I think this next quote from Jung is important because it does acknowledge uh, the value of a meaningful, available therapy or analysis to someone who is experiencing psychosis. One should not underrate the disastrous shock which patients undergo when they find themselves assailed by the intrusion of strange contents which they're unable to integrate. The mere fact that they have such ideas isolates them from their fellow men and exposes them to an irresistible panic which often marks the outbreak of the manifest psychosis. What is happening to me? If, on the other hand, they meet with adequate understanding from their physician, and that might be others besides the physician, obviously, they do not fall into a panic because they are still understood by a human being and thus preserved from the disastrous shock of complete isolation. This is relevant to therapy or an analysis with someone who is experiencing uh, a psychosis or what we call schizophrenia. It's also relevant to family members, partners, pe people who are um, who love someone who is experiencing such a thing, uh, because it has to do with the attitude and the impact of the attitude, and it has to do with the presence and the the, the tremendous uh, connective potential of love. Jung's writings are replete with references to the connection between the archetypes of the collective unconscious and schizophrenia. Consider the following. The archetypal motifs of the unconscious are the psychic source of delusional ideas, especially of the paranoid schizophrenic form. In schizophrenics, the collective contents of the, con of the unconscious predominate strongly in the form of mythological motifs. When people lose their hold on the concrete values of life, the unconscious contents become overwhelmingly real. Considered from the psychological standpoint, psychosis is a mental condition in which formerly unconscious elements take the place of reality. That's a commonality in terms of people who are manifesting what we call schizophrenia. But it's also really important to note, I think, that individuals with schizophrenia are really different from each other. They are potentially influenced by or identified with archetypes as different as everything else about their personalities and lives, just as is true for those who are not psychotic. Others impacted by those individuals, whether family members or clients or strangers, may develop their own complexes in response and are influenced by archetypes that represent their unique experiences with such an encounter. There is no one universal theme that characterizes the individual experience of schizophrenia other than the undoing of whatever you thought your life story was before you encountered that chaos, either within yourself 
or in someone you love. I think that's also a nod to Barry Williams' quote about the undoing of your life in order to have your life, your true life. Okay. I find this quote from Jung particularly relevant in terms of understanding the thoughts and feelings that have been constellated by my encounter with what we call schizophrenia. Um, I'm going to read a little from the book on page 148. Part of depotentiating the schizophrenia complex is recognizing that we just have to bear life's twists and turns, sometimes without understanding, without knowing the reasons why. Facing schizophrenia invokes all that we do not know and cannot explain, for which we have no sure cause or cure. Heroic tenacity in the face of the unknowable, even the intolerable, is a broader archetypal theme interwoven with the story of our lives. Maybe our encounters with schizophrenia and its associated complexes represent an essential truth. Life is what it is, not what we want, need, or hope it will be. Yet the sometimes hidden gold of our tattered existence may lie in the very worst challenges we face. And here's the quote in a letter written days before his death in 1961, Jung made a comment about God that seems relevant here. To this day, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly, all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or worse. What we call schizophrenia represents an immersion of ego consciousness into the deep pool of the unconscious. If the schizophrenia complex is generated by our panic about all we cannot control or understand, perhaps the potential for healing lies in submitting to the will of that divine tumult to which Jung refers, realizing the potential for individuation therein. In the face of devastating upset in our inevitable encounters with those swipes of fate that cross us violently and recklessly, finding enough gold to persevere is ultimately a matter of faith, perspective, and attitude. Jung's quote suggests that such seemingly arbitrary, mysterious, and upsetting circumstances also express the divine, requiring us to withstand the opposites inherent in our human existence. Eros, the archetypal capacity for relatedness, is also part of our divine inheritance, even necessary and perhaps most when logic fails. In the end, in some fundamental way, if we are to survive, it is Eros who can tip the scales, heal a wounded family tree, a dead dream, a broken heart. In Greek mythology, the god Eros is the person personification of love and relatedness, a cosmogonic force of nature. Psychologically, Eros holds the function of relationship. Love is what makes a parent swim out into the deep after a child who has been caught in the undertow. Eros fuels our devotion and profoundly unreasonable tenacity. Love can overrule fear, shock, and sadness all the emotional territory of the schizophrenia complex. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna read just this um, last paragraph of um, the book prior to the afterword. And I now understand as never before that sometimes we simply have to submit to our irrational lives and face the reality of what life brings without our permission. To survive, we must drop our expectations and denial, follow where we can, wait when we cannot follow or fix, and stay as long as we are still breathing. We invoke Eros and hold on to love, treading water, one arm gripping the rim of the deep pool. Thank you.
Well, that was really enlightening. And I myself went through a, a period that is diagnosed as non-differentiated schizophrenia 45 years ago when I was 18. And, and so what you're saying about Eros is really relevant. I, I wanted to bring your attention to the Spiritual Emergency Network. If you're not aware of that, I think it's under the under the agency of Stan Groff. Oh, I know, I know of him. Yeah. yeah, so the Spiritual Emergency Network is a place where the, allegedly, I, I have not been to it, but you know they, they will allow people who are suffering uh, a psychotic break to come and, and, and be held safely. Uh, something that I wanted to mention is that um, in the imagination, there's delusion, there's deception, misconception, and inflation. But there's also the numinous, the miraculous, the divine. And, and, and what inspired Jung was the experiences of prophecy that he experienced. And, and this is relevant to what I went through. As horrendous as it was to literally descend into hell, but at the same time, the information that came through projecting into the future of things that would come to pass is uncanny and profound. And so there's that aspect to it that, that um, there, there's you know, the shamanic side that our culture is just beginning to re-embrace, but you know, we have not you know, had that in our, in our lexicon. So I think that's all I have to say, but I learned so much from this about my own situation. So I really am, am much appreciated and uh, it was of great value. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I am, Judy, do I, do you want me to call on people or how do you wanna do this part? I can't hear you because you're muted. Sorry, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Rhonda Mattern is next. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I, have a bro I had a brother who was schizophrenic. And one of the heart-rending things about schizophrenia that I was not told by his doctors is that antipsychotic drugs usually kill people by the time they're 50. My brother died at 51 from a lifetime of medication. So I'm on the RD line side of the of the seesaw on that one. But my, my question involves a, a profound experience I had with my brother right before he died, which I can't talk about without tearing up. So I'll have to get through it quickly and, you know, with tears. Um, I had read that Milton Erickson could cure schizophrenics by uh, just entering into their world as if it were real and really being at one with their world, which is a very Jungian concept, I think, in some sense. And so one day uh, when he was talking about worms crawling through his blood, I, you know, which is something he typically did, or being hung on the cross, but this day it was worms crawling on the blood, I decided to really feel that with him, to really enter into it as if it were real. And to my shock, I found myself responding Dave, that's scary as hell. We've got to do something about that. We've got to stop that right away. And he started crying and told, all of a sudden he shifted gears completely and recounted a, a painful experience from our childhood. We grew up with a, with a violent alcoholic father. So this continued over and over that day. And he snapped out of his psycho psychosis for two or three weeks after that. So my question for you is, because I'm not a formal Jungian, though I read Jung every day and try to live Jungian, a Jungian life. Uh, my question is, from a Jungian perspective, what do you think caused that shift? Was, to me, I think it's the arrows in accepting everything as it is, accepting his reality, but I don't know. So I'm curious about your perspective. <laughs> First of all, I disagree. I think you are a real Jungian. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a way of life more than anything else. And mm -hmm. I, the, the scene you're describing with your brother is a beautiful illustration of what Nathan Schwartz a lot was referring to. And he talked about entering the, that world with the other person. As soon as there's a level of recognition, of connection, that attack on relatedness 
it, it's if not healed, it goes away for a while and then mm -hmm. we have to explain why for a period afterwards he, he was no longer disconnected because he felt seen mm -hmm. terrifying isn't it i mean you really did have to go to a, a very this a lot of times that where they are is a scary place mm -hmm. but your love is what encouraged you to join him there and I suspect that was transformative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We have Lev Krasnoselsky. Oh, terrific. Thank you. This is like, you know, perfect rendering of my name. No, really. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, hi. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Merrim, for uh, you know lecture. Um, and I have a following remark. Um, you mentioned several times, you know, stigma or even taboo when it comes to talking about schizophrenia or mental disorders. Uh, my question is, uh, have you explored uh, fear of death in relationship to, you know, those taboos or stigma that's right? Uh, reason for that is that, you know, it's almost like my ego is being dissolved and unconscious. This is the end of me. This is death, right? And you know, like whenever I see something dead, I don't want to touch it with a 10, you know, fit ball, right? So what do you think? Like, is is there like a really point of discussing death? Maybe I, family members, maybe patients, you know, that's type of thing. I'm sorry, I didn't get the last thing, the last thing you said. No, I'm saying, do, do you think it, it really matters, you know, to discuss death, right? Fear of death. Because that, I think, ultimately leads to being able to accept death of ego and therefore accept or at least be able to deal with such disorders. Mm. You, you know, I don't know if that's so much a question as a statement, because I, I think you're absolutely correct. I, I, I thought I, I really touched on that. And there's more to that effect in the book, how um, mm -hmm. that, that helps to explain our fear of the irrational of you know the chaos associated with the unconscious is because bottom line there's a fear of annihilation if my mm -hmm. ego is is flooded with contents from the unconscious where do i go it's worse than death if you believe in an afterlife or heaven or you know the other kinds of spiritual constructs that we can come up with to explain what happens after a physical death that's different this is like you're gone there is no you mm -hmm. it's it's a, a ceasing to exist which is appropriately terrifying. So yes, absolutely. I think that has a lot to do with why we feel fear when we see someone in what, what we think is a psychotic state. What mitigates that though, and the stigma and the fear of death when we make that association is this kind of thinking it through and naming it because then we, we realize then there's room for understanding. There's room for the arrows part of the equation. Hmm. All right, thank you. So you 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 do touch upon that in your in your book. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, if you, one one more quick remark, I didn't see any other hands. You know, just till this. Um, no, it's it's got something to do that was mentioned again several times. And uh, you know, first of all, the meeting began with the dream. Thank you for sharing the dream. You know, it's important. And uh, you know, you also quoted your son saying the dream world is fun, right? So the theme of dream is here. And uh, how much of a, you know, and then also like, so, you know, previous, uh, you know, people who commented, right? It's almost like meeting psychosis in the way of psychosis, right? And like, what else is better for that than doing dream work? And I mean, you know, dream work in the sense of not so much of, you know, doing associations, uh, a little bit, of, you know, something like a dream tenzin that is, you know, uh, developed by uh, Dr. Steven Eisenstadt, for example, right? So we, where it really, our kids into explore the dream world by simply paying attention, trying to see what's out there. So, uh, do you approach, uh, you know, patients with schizophrenia by doing dream work process, not just paying attention to the dreams, like really approaching the whole thing as if it were a dream, notion like psychosis is a dream or dream is a psychosis. Well, if you're going to do dream work, if I was going to do dream work with someone who had psychosis, I would only do that once they had enough ego stability to be able to be conscious of the differentiation between when they actually are dreaming and their experience of their lives. I mean, when my, when my, that, that quote from my son, 
Um, I know that he said, you know, the dream world is fun, but he wasn't really referring to, I had a dream and this is what it was like. He was referring to that experience of living the dream. Oh, absolutely. And that's where I'm getting at. So it's not like a dream work because somebody brings a dream in and says, hey, I got a dream, you know, doctor, and this is very interesting. Can we, you know, associate, you know, and do what not, right? I'm saying exactly what you're saying, right? Realizing that this is a dream, right? The whole experience is a dream. There is no, you know, distinct part. Here's the wake life, here's the dream, right? So we approach the whole thing as if it were a dream and apply the dream work process to the whole situation. Well, the way I'm, what? yeah, the way I'm understanding what you're saying is less about uh, accepting the whole situation as though it were a dream, uh, as just accepting the whole situation as what is real. And even though the the person with psychosis is having an experience that we would think of as a dream, it's kind of like what Rhonda was talking about. And when when she was able yeah. to enter into that, yeah. I suppose that would be a form of, I think, mm -hmm. what you're referring to when you say approach the whole experience as a dream. That's true for all of us, isn't it? In a way, we can look at our lives that way, you know, and, mm -hmm. and accepting somebody else's version of it who has more a, of a connection in the unconscious in that waking moment, you know, that, that's where we get challenged because we're being asked to come out of our comfort zone in order to join them there. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, thank you. Hey, Dennis, one of our favorite speakers, Dennis Merritt. Thank you, Judy. Or well, thank you so much for uh, this uh, presentation. I think it um, it enters um, into the most difficult domains of what it is to be human. Uh, just a comment before I ask a, a question of you, but uh, when I started uh, on my master's degree in humanistic psychology at Sonoma State. Um, the only background I had was uh, some knowledge of Jung and the I Ching, but I ended up working with a man in a, a mental health unit of a public uh, hospital. And he had been at the uh, California, I think in Napa, the big mental health uh, hospital there, a schizophrenic, and he was on heavy meds and realized when he was pushing a broom around one day that he was never going to get better. So he was determined to get out of the hospital, do whatever he could. So when I met him, he was not on meds. But um, when we get into some difficult stuff, he would just be squeezing his legs really tightly, just trying to hang on to it. And we did some dream work. I didn't know any better. But he had a dream about um, when his ex-wife walking over his chest with spikes, uh, knife-like spikes on the bottom of his feet. And I said, boy, that's really a negative anima. And that concept of the anima uh, helped him give some objectivity to it. It seemed to have helped. Mm -hmm. But uh, he met his wife uh, at the hospital, was also schizophrenic. And I was doing couples therapy with them at one point. <laughs> so uh, there is something about being open to all that. And I really love John Weir Perry's book. Um, but I was wondering if uh, maybe you did it in your first talk on this. But could you say something more about the journey with your son? How that went? Um, uh, how long it took him to get medications and so on? Because you have such a rich personal experience with that. And I think we can all learn from it. Well, first of all, for clarification, I have, there was no first presentation. This book just came out a couple months ago and um, I did present for Young Club years ago, but it was a different book. So this, um, this is our intro into the world with this material. And um, honestly, I'm, I'm I'm reticent to get into a lot of detail about the, the story with my son. Um, there is more of that in the book. Uh, mm, it took years. And um, part of what we went through was our own denial that what was going on with him was going on with him. Um, the actual uh, radical departure that I allude to in the book took place in 2013. I would say, you know, there was a lot of intervention on our parts, a lot of uh, 
action trying to hook him up with resources that were few and far between and we are you know we tried really hard it's it's terrible there's a real dearth of anything out there uh difficult to get on medication he did i mean he finally did it wasn't easy by a long shot but i would say within a couple of years uh, there was enough stability there that um, he could really begin to make some progress and he's he's absolutely you know he's still got his issues but he's fully functional and can live independently and work and all that now so um I don't know if that helps. That's well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna oops, she disappeared. Um, because I not I would uh like to call on people who haven't already spoken first. So there was Laura was there. Do you wanna you disappeared? Um, well, there you are. Okay. Uh -huh. Laura Lewis Thayer. If she's on mute, there. There we go. Thank you very much for your um, for your lecture and all this wonderful information. I just I had a comment and and I'm sorry I missed the first part of your lecture. I did my very um, nonsense Jungian thing and had a hard time finding the link to get on, so I got on a little late, and I hope I didn't miss this part, but I was thinking a lot about also Helene Shulman Lorenz, who did research in Africa, how some of the tribal peoples would deal with schizophrenia. And I thought, well, I'm really glad I don't live and work there because the shaman would would bring the, the individual in the village who was schizophrenic to live with them for many weeks at a time. And then the entire community would do a ritual. And one of the things that she wrote in her book is that they very often found that when the, the schizophrenia was held as um, an expression of the entire community, that the individual was really loaded up with some collective issue that they were caring for an entire group of people. And when it was held in that way and then ritually worked with, um, by the whole community that they would very often see that there was extraordinary healing that happened. Um, I don't know. I know in this culture, we don't work that way, but I, I often wonder what the larger group impact is. What a good example of a, of a collective attitude that was inclusive and could hold the person. I mean, that's another example of what happens when there's a kind of an Eros connection that is accepting and open as opposed to the opposite. I mean, no, we don't do that in this culture. And Wait, Tanya, I'm going to mute you for now. Sorry, we were getting sound from another speaker. The only other comment I was going to make is that I um, I haven't had a lot of opportunity to work uh, with schizophrenic patients, but I I practice in two fields as a Jungian analyst and also in um, Chinese medicine. And when I was first in practice, I had a Chinese doctor living with my then husband and I to help me establish my practice and was seeing a schizophrenic young man, and he exhibited symptoms after doing really intensive meditation. And this um, elderly doctor from China, who's quite renowned, said that they see schizophrenia, what they're referring to as schizophrenia a lot, when um, young men with a lot of, we say young, but a lot of testosterone, are meditating and it creates all this heat that goes to the head and kind of fries things. And so there's a whole physiological way of working with schizophrenia too. And I just thought I would mention those two pieces because they might not be commonly um, factored in from our, you know, our normal Euro and North American perspectives. So Again, thank you. I don't know if that's of interest, but thank you. Sure, of course it is. Those things came to mind. 
Okay, now we have Tanya Hurst. Hi, um, I was really intrigued by um, your information about the complex of those who have loved ones who have schizophrenia. Um, and I would like to hear more about that, or maybe I'll get the book and read more about that. But one of the things um, I wanted to talk to, to just mention briefly, and that I find fascinating, well, one, that the topic is so relevant and fresh always. And, um, but my biological father had schizophrenia, and it was quite the ordeal for me as a four-year-old going through his, you know, psychosis, um, being left in a cave overnight once and witnessing him shooting himself. And, you know, he survived, thank goodness. But um, anyways, my trauma from the experience, my first time seeing a psychiatrist was when I was uh, four years old. And the I was a very smart four-year-old. Of course, I had to be to survive some of those experiences. Um, but so I learned that if I just kept quiet, I would get to color with the big crayons anyways at the end of the session. <laughs> but the advice from the psychiatrist to my mother, and I think I only saw him two or three times, was that she should never let me tell a lie and that I was never to play pretend and never to, you know, use my imagination. And so when I was a little girl, this was daunting for me because I wasn't allowed to play pretend or use my imagination. And a lot of my healing has been learning to access my imagination and not be afraid I'm going to lose my mind as a result or, you know, possession of my own mind. But what I find fascinating, because that was a long time ago, I was born in 68 and come forward all these years. And as a therapist myself now, when I'm working with a young child that has had a traumatic experience and is having, you know, they're not quite out of the unconscious yet. <laughs> so they need help with that to sort of get grounded in reality. And, and what I do you know, from, from the guidance of my own analyst is read fairy tales to them. And so I'm just amazed that back then the advice was no imagination. And then now, you know, for little children in that situation, the fairy tales have so many solutions built in. And um, anyways, I just wanted to, to, to put that out there into the collective here. So thanks for letting me share that. Thank you, Tanya. It was very relevant. And, you know, that the psychiatrist you had when you were four had a, an obvious schizophrenia complex, right? That's what it looks like. And I, I think it's wonderful that you're able to work with children who've had their own traumas uh, and help them to bridge from the unconscious to conscious. And fairy tales are a wonderful way to do that. That's, you know, thank you. Um, Eve, I want to ask you, are you able to stay beyond six o'clock? Sure. Okay. Um, some, I'm, I'm ask, calling on people that haven't um, spoken before. There are some from before with their hands raised. And so if we have time, we'll, we'll get to you. Um, so next is Alina Rott. Hi, thank you for having me. It was an amazing lecture. Thank you so much for sharing your life with us. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a very short, very short two questions. How old is the oldest schizophrenic, uh, schizophrenic person? Does somebody know? And um, if the personal, I'm not a psychologist, I'm just somebody who's very curious. If the personal moods or however you call it complex changes in a schizophrenic person when the person gets older, I'm just curious if the complex is changing and develops somehow on its own over the years. I think that's it's it's very difficult to say. I mean, as far as how old the oldest schizophrenic person, ha I have no idea. I don't think we know uh, all of who has schizophrenia. I don't even think we know all of what schizophrenia is. Um, but um, I know that there is research that suggests that 
even if left untreated, the condition tends to, it, it, the, the manifest symptoms tend to uh, reduce over, over time. So um, probably it would, it would abate somewhat. That's different from the schizophrenia complex, which has to do with the feeling part, you know, the, the thoughts, the feelings that we have about schizophrenia. And I, I don't know that I would make any correlation uh, with, regarding, with regard to age um, having to do with that. I mean, sometimes when people get older, they become more rigid. Sometimes they open up to uh, changes in attitude, which is what we're about here today. <laughs> um, okay, let's go back to Rhonda. Thanks for the chance to a follow-up question. I'll try to be brief. Um, Eve, I imagine most of the clinicians on the call here do not work with psychotics much. <laughs> Just, I'm guessing. Uh, uh, and I'm wondering if you would be open to presenting to social workers who do, uh, and maybe even doing a presentation about how they could shift their schizophrenia complex. And I have a very specific audience in mind. <laughs> I happen to know the social worker at my brother's, you know, psychiatric institution, and she's a very open-minded person. I was not able, they were all amazed that he came home non-psychotic for three weeks, non-delusional. And when I told them what I, th I did, they rolled their eyes as if that's foolish. And so I think somebody with your stature, uh, 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 you know, clinical psychologist might get through to them in a different way. And just, um, something to think about and I'm wondering if you're interested in that uh, because I think it would be of huge value to social workers who are dealing with psychotics every day. Thank you for your consideration and um, let's we can certainly have a conversation about mm -hmm. it. You can email me and I'd be happy to talk about it. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay and we'll go back to Lev. Uh, yeah, thank you. No, it's it's just a quick follow up because it, it feels important, you know, because, uh, you know, Rhonda brought something up and then Laura, you know, saying, well, trip to Africa, see how, you know, people are treated in Africa. But, you know, what the interesting thing is that I, I read, uh, you know, works by, uh, you know, so direct analysis is John Rosen, right? And basically, you know, what Rosen does is exactly what, you know, people in Africa do, right? And his approach you know, will be sort of like really time consuming. You know, you could spend like, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, you know, maybe more with the single patient, you know, and that's exactly taking in the patient being sort of like a part of the patient tribe or family, you know, and even like, you know, forget John Rosnick and, you know, since this is a Jungian, you know, meeting, right? Von Franz in like documentary, you know, Power of Dream would mention how in Switzerland in a village, right? There would be, let's say a kleptomaniac, and everybody would be warned saying, well, you know, don't call the police on this guy, you know, because like he's going to steal things, but we'll give it back to you. So they knew how to approach this as the whole community. So, you know, this is a comment that, you know, and then the Brazen, you know, and then there is also a jet propelled couch, which is a collection of case studies by Robert Lindner. Right. And all this stuff dates to like 1950s, you know. So, uh, Dr. Merrim, do you see any like change, you know, happening, right? You know, where like any notions of communities being created to deal with, you know, such psychiatric disorders? I wish I could answer differently, but unfortunately, no, I don't. And um, that, that, was part of the frustration, the, the devastating frustration of my experience. Uh, but at least we're having these conversations. So who knows what may open up from here? But thank you. Mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Thank you. I just felt important. So, you know, like really, it's, it's reprinted direct analysis by Rosen. So, you know, it's, it's a very interesting approach to, to, you know, it's not in Jungian framework by any means, but, you know, still, I think it's very worth taking a look at. Thank you. Thank you. I, I could answer that. There's a, a movement in Japan, which is to take the psychotic or schizophrenic community and put them at the center of the community so that everybody is interacting with them. And, and in my own experience, I, I stopped doing all the psychotropic drugs. I, I thought they were killing me, but I got into college and the structure of that community in college 
was the external framework that allowed my ego to find its way. And uh, so that I think that's really, you know, saying the same thing that there, I, I didn't tell anybody what I'd been through and I kept it to myself. And one more point is when I connected with the young center of Buffalo and became part of that community, it suddenly provided the framework for me to understand these, you know, becoming, <laughs> becoming God, becoming the devil, meeting God, meeting the devil, going to hell, and, you know, finding reptilians in the underworld, all these strange archetypal experiences that I can't say were not real, but they happened in the imagination when that veil between the dream and the waking world dissolved and I was plunged into the dream 24 hours, 24 hours a day. But the young philosophy was the framework. And there was a big shift in 2009 when the Red Book came out. And what had always been sort of posited as, well, all of this medical, psychological lingo about what was going on was set to the side. And we suddenly were facing an actual spiritual world. And this was a big shift that the, the, our modern world is the sickness, right? We're an economic paradigm to really attacking the world, the environment. And this is a collective sickness. So I think that's why some people are suffering. I know that was part of my dilemma, you know, was this heroic quest to somehow save the planet. And, uh, but anyway, that, that's all I have to say. But again, I thank you. It was really, really wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I think that's it. Um, I do want to say that I was taught in psychology in college that the refrigerator mother was the cause of schizophrenia. <laughs> I remember that. Um, thank you so much. This has been really, really interesting. And I encourage everybody to read your book, which is, is even more interesting. So uh, we'll say goodbye. And I hope to see, oh, wait a minute. Does somebody, no, oh no, those are, oh, that's a heart. <laughs> not, not a raised hand, a heart. Thank you. Um, so I hope to see you all in January, uh, in February for Holly Fincher's talk. And thank you again, Eve. This was really wonderful. Bye all. All of you. Much appreciated. <laughs>